RC here, and today we are going to be dealing with a documentary hypothesis, which to me is a now failed thesis on the topic of Old Testament textual criticism. For those unfamiliar with it, it's the idea that Moses didn't even author the first five books of the Bible. And for the sake of this video, we will address these first five books as either the Torah or the Pentateuch. Let's get started. There are people today who adhere to this thesis which states that pretty much four individual sources exist in which the composition of the Torah was done. Keep in mind that this particular study had to get me to dive into the liberal scholarship as well that supports this idea in order to define it properly. So concerning where this all begins, it mostly began with a French physician named Jean Astruc with his book Conjectures on Genesis. This mostly began with him seeing the different references to God by either Yahweh or Elohim as being the work of composing the Book of Moses from two different sources. The Yahweh references were part of the J source or the Yahwist source, where the Elohim references were part of the E source or Elohist source. So supposedly, two different groups who referred to God under a different name with different theologies in mind. However, it eventually evolved and was perfected by a man named Julius Wellhausen, who eventually added the priestly source and the Deuteronomic source. This is mostly the theory that is being pushed today by those who affirm the documentary hypothesis. While at a basic level, it can seem convincing, we must examine critically this critical theory against the authorship of Moses. Ironic how we have to examine critically a critical theory. Then we will try to make a brief case for the authorship of Moses in light of what we've learned. So here's something to keep in mind. Much like the Exodus issue, this too is one where the majority consensus is in agreement with the J, E, P, and D theory. However, there are issues with this. First of all, simply having that as a reason to believe in the theory is nothing more than a mix of the appeal to authority fallacy and appeal to common belief fallacy. Secondly, the evidence that may be in view by the majority of scholars may be nothing more than assumptions and stretches. Remember that when Astruc first founded the theory, this was merely a conjecture to him. To kind of comment on this kind of idea, here's what James White once said during his debate with Adnan Rashid on Is the Bible Corrupted? Show me a single manuscript. It's easy, folks, to come up with liberal theories about redaction criticism because you don't have to come up with any evidence. Very difficult to debate those things. Uh, there is a, a, a film just uh, aired here in England about uh, the Quran and these origins of Muhammad and things like that. And most of you Muslims are going, hey, how about some, how about some actual evidence? How about some citations from the Quran? Many people point out that there are these four sources, but don't really tell us how we know it's the work of another source, or if there is a source at all in manuscript form. Old Testament scholar Walter C. Kaiser Jr. says the following, quote, No one has ever seen such J, E, D, and P documents, or any allusions to them in any ancient literature, paralleling if the tenfold reference to the accounts and generations of in Genesis. At least when scholars formulate theories, they do it based off actual other sources. There is zero other sources besides trying to find phrases in the biblical text. Even the liberal scholarship books I've read didn't pull out these sources, but instead say these are things they think are likely due to different names and supposedly different theologies in the text. There has been the release of a book by a Jewish scholar named Umberto Casuto called The Documentary Hypothesis. That is old, but it has been the start of what becomes the declining of the consistency of the documentary hypothesis. Before we continue, let's show how Casuto debunks the hypothesis claims of the names of God and the literary style slash vocabulary of their claims. The first is mostly dealing with the J and the E sources that say Yahweh and Elohim are from two different sources. Concerning this, Casuto says this about the Torah and the names. Quote, it selected the name Yahweh when the text reflects the Israelite conception of God, which is embodied in the portrayal of Yahweh and finds expression in the attributes traditionally ascribed to him by Israel, particularly in his ethical character. 
it preferred the name Elohim when the passage implies the abstract idea of the deity prevalent in the international circles of wise men. So just because there are different Hebrew words used to refer to God does not automatically imply that they are different names to other gods. Another point from Kasudo is the style and the language. Kasudo states, quote, We must not rely upon the difference in language in order to determine the origin of the sections, which we shall subsequently use to decide the linguistic char characteristics of the sources. For in that case, we shall indeed fall into the snare of reasoning into a circle, nor consider words or forms mechanically as though they were divorced from their context, and the latter could have no bearing on their use. Now, to go over another issue, the problem also exists with the fact that the theory has become too complicated than it even needs to be. Messianic Jewish scholar David H. Stern notes that the evolution of more than four sources on how the four originals are now even divided in his article, Recent Trends in Biblical Source Criticism, that was published in the 2008 Jewish Bible Quarterly. Quote, in addition to Wellhausen's four sources, J, E, P, and D, some scholars speculate about sources labeled Lay, L, Nomadic, N, Kenite, K, Southern or Seir, S, and the foundational source, Grundlage, G. Not only do scholars multiply the number of sources, some applying the same methodology, fragment J, E, P, and D, into further subdivisions and view these documents as products of schools which shaped and reshaped these documents by further additions. So it gets complicated when we begin to actually narrow down our sources at this point. And while there's a majority consensus on a theory, not even that majority can reach a consensus on what sources apply to which text of the Torah. Furthermore, Stern cites Pauline Viviano, who notes, quote, The more sources one finds, the more tenuous the evidence for the existence of continuous documents becomes, and the less likely that four unified documents ever existed. Even for those able to avoid skepticism and confusion in the face of the ever-increasing number of sources, the only logical conclusion seems to be to move away from Wellhausen's documentary hypothesis toward a position closer to the fragmentary hypothesis. Finally, on this point, ancient Near East and Old Testament scholar John D. Curid notes that, quote, very few scholars today accept the documentary hypothesis we originally formulated. The issue of authorship has become much more complex. There is, in reality, little consensus among scholars regarding who wrote what and when, even though they continue to use the acronym JEDP. So somebody can say that the majority of scholars agree on this, but at this point, it's evolved to being a much more complex issue with the different hypothetical sources. Heck, there's a doubt being casted on the existence of an E source at this point, since some of the other sources showed up. Which means if you want to prove to me that this is going to be factual, you need to show me evidence and consistency to support the hypothesis based on actual manuscript documents of these supposed sources, as well as that your arguments can stay consistent. Now to make a case for the authorship of Moses, keep in mind that while it doesn't have his name literally on it um, in the titles, besides the traditional first five books of Moses, we will utilize other criteria to determine Mosaic authorship for at least a majority while recognizing where some difficulties arise. This will consist of arguing from the text and even going to scholars to help shed light on the historical context. Now, textually, other biblical figures in history, as well as the Jews, recognize the authorship of Moses. So, when we look at several biblical passages that show Jesus and others recognizing and giving authorship to Moses based on oral tradition, this demonstrates biblically for the case of Mosaic authorship. The Torah itself doesn't identify the books as written by Moses in their books on the title, but in the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, Daniel Block tells us that, quote, the bewildering variety of theories fosters little confidence in critical scholarship. However, the fact remains that nowhere does the Pentateuch specifically name its author, as was common in the ancient Semitic world. It is anonymous. 
So simply it being anonymous was not a unique thing to do because it was common to have your work in the ancient Semitic world to be anonymous. You can examine this when looking at other ancient Near Eastern literature, yet when we have other works we attribute authorship to, we got no problem just blindly accepting the validity of attributed authors and not questioning who actually wrote these. Another criticism that would be argued is that Moses would have been illiterate. This is a similar criticism used against the New Testament by people like Ehrman. However, it can't be applied here since the story depicts a change of Moses being literate concerning his background. Again, Block notes, quote, Moses very well could have written most of the Pentateuch himself. Having been raised in the court of Pharaoh and given the new 22-letter alphabet, Moses' own literary qualifications for writing should not be dismissed. Another point from Block expressed in his dictionary entry includes the fact that there are eight points in the text that should be considered concerning an early date composition versus a later date composition. They are as follows, quote, The forms of the names and many of the actions of the patriarchs make best sense in a second millennium BC environment. The narrative suggests a thorough acquaintance with Egypt. Egyptian loanwords appeared with greater frequency in the Pentateuch than anywhere else in the Old Testament. The name Moses itself suggests an Egyptian provenance for the story. The general viewpoint of the narrative is foreign to Canaan. The seasons are Egyptian. In some instances, the geography reflects a foreign viewpoint. And finally, archaisms in the language, like the use of the third person singular pronoun he, for both genders, all point to a later date. If people still want to argue for a later date, keep this in mind as this final quote from Bloch points out. Quote, there is no reason to doubt Moses wrote down the speeches he delivered, Deuteronomy 31, verses 9 through 13, or that when he came down from Mount Sinai, he arranged for the transcription of the revelation he had received on the mountain, if he did not write it all himself. It is equally plausible that he authorized the written composition of many of the stories and genealogies of the patriarchs that had been transmitted orally or in rudimentary form. Just as the pieces of the tabernacle were constructed and woven by skilled craftsmen and finally assembled by Moses, Exodus chapter 35 through 40, so literary craftsmen may have composed some bits and pieces of the Pentateuch and submitted them to Moses, who then approved them. A final point to look at where most people think this is the nail in the coffin is Deuteronomy 34, among of course other instances, which records the death of Moses. They argue that a dead man cannot write about his death. Me and others agree, which is why we don't argue for him writing this. Some have tried to avoid this by saying Moses was prophetically writing his death, but this begs more questions than it does answering them. So even in light of this, who did write it? As we noted, it's possible for scribes to have done it, especially Joshua, who could have wrote in this since he did author the book of Joshua that comes next. In an article for the ESV Study Bible, Gordon J. Wenham says the following, quote, Indeed, the Pentateuch looks like a life of Moses, with an introduction. But this need not mean that he wrote every word of the present Pentateuch. It seems likely that the spelling and the grammar of the Pentateuch were revised to keep it intelligible for later readers. Also, a number of features in the text looks like clarifications for a later age, but this is quite different from supposing that the Pentateuch was essentially composed in a later age. Rather, it should be seen as originating in Moses' time, but undergoing some slight revision in later eras so later readers could understand its message and apply it to their own situations. So in light of all these points to consider, mosaic authorship can easily be argued for as well as defended by good and consistent scholarship. Never accept a hypothesis as valid just because it's in a majority. For even as Bart Ehrman once said, There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. Now, that is not evidence. That is not evidence. Just because everybody thinks so doesn't make it evidence. But if you want to know about the theory of evolution versus the theory of creationism, and every scholar in every reputable institution in the world thinks that believes in evolution, it may not be evidence, but if you've got a different opinion, you better have a pretty good piece of evidence yourself.
So even the scholar in a majority position on the existence of Jesus admits that argument from a majority is not a good enough argument, but it's the evidence itself that is needing to be good and consistent, not just the testimony of a scholar. I believe here though, I have given plenty of evidence to debunk the documentary hypothesis and to prove mosaic authorship, but now it is up to you to decide for yourself what position to take. This has been RC Apologist, take care.